So this uh, presentation uh, will be all about preparation of your uh, alignment for uh, variant analysis. So that's actually a very substantial part of the of the variant analysis, a very important part, because if you uh, make uh, the choices you make uh, during the alignment and preparation of the alignment can have a big effect on your variant analysis itself. So that's why we uh, spent quite a bit of uh, time on it. Uh, also, of course, the choices you make for sequencing have a big effect, uh, depending very much on the technology uh, you choose. Uh, you can do certain uh, types of uh, analysis uh, or not. For example, whether you choose between long reads or short reads. <clears throat> so um, there are a lot of ways uh, nowadays to uh, sequence uh, DNA. Um, of course, uh, as you might know, at least, uh, it all started with uh, Sanger sequencing. Um, and that is a method that generates relatively uh, long reads, but at relatively low throughput. And that's what this figure is about. That's what you can, what you can see in this figure is all of the uh, different sequencing methods that are frequently used today or have been frequently used because some of them do not exist anymore. On the X axis over here, you see basically the average read length a method uh, can uh, produce in the log scale and the throughput also in the log scale. So the number of bases it can produce uh, per run. So both of them are, of course, important. Read length is important for <clears throat> um, read length is important for uh, whether you can, um, for example, uh, generate haplotypes in 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 the in the context of variant analysis, or whether you can assemble genomes, for example. And throughput usually is uh, very much related to the cost per per base. So how much sequence can you generate? for a thousand euros, for example. Um, so as you can see, many different sequencing technologies. Uh, Sanger sequencing is, is a very important one, or at least has been a very important one with relatively high read length. So it's on the on basically on the right side of the graph, but very low uh, throughput. Um, the, the brown dots you see over here are all of the Illumina sequencers, and they're basically their evolution uh, through time. Uh, nowadays, you see that you have different Illumina platforms with relatively low throughput and, and very high uh, throughput. Its competitor, or at least uh, it, um, it was a competitor, ABI sequencing is, uh, is depicted in green that has been discontinued just because it was just too costly and there was not a big difference in, in quality and throughput as compared, compared to Illumina sequencing. In blue, we see ion torrent sequencing. So ion torrent sequencing um, uh, can produce a bit longer reads compared to uh, Illumina sequencing, but also has its own challenges. Won't go into too much detail uh, regarding that technology. In orange, we see 454 uh, sequencing. I don't think it is used anymore. I think the brand is still used for some specific kind of sequencing, but it's, that, that's different. Um, and then on the right side, of course, with longer read lengths, we see back biosequencing and Oxford Nanopore uh, technology. Well, this is an uh, image from 2016. And of course, uh, things have changed since then, especially for the long read sequencers. Also a bit for the short read sequencers, for example, Illumina has introduced uh, a machine with even higher throughput uh, or actually two machines with higher throughput than it was than they had in 2016. Um, but also Oxford Nanopore technology, for example, introduced their Prometheon, which has a massive uh, throughput. So man can create a lot of bases per run. And then also, of course, with uh, a pretty long uh, read length. Also, Pack Bio didn't sit still. Uh, for Pack Bio, uh, in the meantime, SQL 2 has introduced has been introduced with um, high throughput and high read length, and even uh, more recently. So nowadays, the Pack Bio Revio can be uh, shipped. So also now, for example, in Bern, we will acquire it in 
take November a review with uh, a very competitive throughput to Oxford Nanopore uh, technology. As you might know, uh, there's also a third component that is important for sequencing technology, and that is actually the quality. So the base quality, more about that later. Um, where Illumina has, has a relatively high base quality, meaning that there are very few errors in the sequences it produces. For Oxford Nanopore technology, it is very much uh, improving or has improved in the last years, but uh, still uh, is, is not yet at the level, but it's getting close to Illumina sequencing, while back bio sequencing nowadays has very high base quality, so very few uh, errors it produces. Martin has a question. Yes, uh, the <clears throat> Oxford nanopore, that's basically the min ion there or something? Or... Yeah, so the min ion are the, is, are the bottom yellow dot. Yeah. And different versions of the min ion. So you always do nanopore sequencing with a min ion machine or something like that? Or... <clears throat> no, no. So, but the technology is, is all the same. Okay. For different machines, but uh, it depends on the size of the flow cell. You have different sizes of flow cells, so that can uh, generate more or, or fewer reads. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends basically on the number of pores that are on the flow cell. And okay. uh, with uh, other machines like Promethean, but there, there are more, uh, those flow cells can also be going also run in parallel. So you can even have uh, parallel flow cells running at the same time. And that, of course, very much increases uh, the throughput. Mm, thanks. OK, Lorena's question. Uh, yes. Uh, so for example, for whole genome sequence, uh, which one would you recommend? Uh, is it for, PACTEO for, for whole, whole genome? Genome, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> So let's say really right now, the cost per base um, so is still uh, quite a lot higher for back bio sequencing compared to Illumina sequencing. So, um, so the big advantage for back bio sequencing compared to Illumina sequencing is that your base is in a long read, which is usually increases, for example, mapping quality, as we will learn later on. And your base quality is higher, which is also important for, for variant analysis. However, for many projects, especially if you want to sequence many samples, so if you want to sequence an entire cohort, back biosequencing will still be too expensive. This might actually change uh, with the review, uh, which also the cost per base is starting to approach the smaller uh, Illumina machine. So at some point, you might be in a situation where uh, researchers actually choose long read sequencing like tech biosequencing for uh, whole genome variant analysis. However, uh, if you ask your sequencing provider a question now, they will advise you to do Illumina sequencing just because it is uh, now uh, affordable to sequence many genomes with Illumina sequencing. Well, not it's not probably yet affordable if you want to do it with tech biosequencing. Uh, and which of these uh, uh, for the dominance, maybe the, the high sec, for example? Which one of uh, these is the high sec? The, I mean, for the Illumina, you mean, uh, for example, the high sec here in the figure? Mm hmm. For so example. I am not really which a machine specialist, but they, they must be somewhere over here. Again, uh -huh. it's a figure from 2016. So things probably have slightly changed, mm -hmm. but they are probably over here. So we have the Nova seek, for example. That is probably already over here. So mm. with, with very high throughput. Or it's actually, okay. I think it's similar throughput that's from Ethion actually. So it's probably over here, something mm. like that. And then I also have this this newest machine which even has a higher throughput. And I don't know by heart how, how much it is. But I think for mm. Illumina, it's important to know that you have <clears throat> different machines. Um, so you can have uh, you can produce in a single run uh, fewer or more uh, bases more fewer or more sequences and that makes it uh, quite scalable for um uh also nanopore technology that is actually very extreme in terms of scalability because you have this min ion which only produces relatively few uh reads so re relatively low fixed cost per run 
and the Prometheum, it uh, generates really, really a lot of uh, a lot of read, billions, billions of reads, uh, and everything in between. So in that sense, Oxford Nanopore technology is very scalable and probably, as you know, also very portable. Well, that is not really the case for Illumina and Black Bio. So if you want to sequence only, for example, a few amplicons, you probably want to choose either Oxford Nanopore technology or maybe Sanger sequencing. If you want to sequence whole genomes, probably either Illumina or Black Bio sequencing. Or uh, the big machine of Oxford Nanopore technology, of course. Thanks. Good. Any other questions? If not, yes, uh, yes, oh, um, yes, there I, is one. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, I just said that, uh, just purely from the computational from the perspective of analysis, is that something that you need to do differently or keep in mind when you do your uh, you know, whole exome on the long reads or on the short reads? <clears throat> or is it just basically the same steps in the analysis, mm. or you just maybe get better? Uh, calling of the haplotypes if you have a long reads. So, so, so basically, can it be said generally that purely from the computational perspective, it's always better to have the long reads? Uh, I think I can answer that question with yes. Uh, it's almost always better to have longer reads. And that is just because uh, your, your mapping qualities, for example, in, in, in regions where it is very difficult to align short reads. It's usually much better uh, with longer reads. However, uh, many of the methods that are around are very much optimized for Illumina uh, sequencing. So many things we are going to do during the exercises are quite specific for, for Illumina sequencing. And that's just because Illumina sequencing is, is nowadays still the golden standard for, for variant analysis. Um, because you know most of the genomes that are generated that are resequenced are resequenced with Illumina uh, sequencing and with, not with like biosequencing. However, there are very uh, good programs uh, to do variant analysis with both Oxford Nanopore technology and like biosequencing. For example, uh, Deep Variant from from Google is an example of that that can very very well handle these these long reads uh, data. So and. So computationally, it definitely has an effect. You probably use different software because uh, so, uh, software might be more optimized for, for longer reads. Um, and most of the times it is, uh, you, you, you will get a better result if you use long read uh, sequencing. Of course, there's a lot of bots, but in general, I think that is almost always the case. Okay, thank you. Okay, then we continue. I thought I had a question there. Oh, that's okay. So uh, during this course, we will, uh, especially during the exercises, we will focus on Illumina sequencing. Uh, so we will. I will also go quite uh, deep into what the technology actually is and what kind of uh, caveats there are uh, for for uh, variance analysis. So it's uh, a sequencing by synthesis uh, method, also referred to as second generation sequencing. Well, these long uh, read sequencing uh, techniques are also considered as third generation sequencing. Um, uh, the, a single machine, a single run, can have massive uh, throughput. For example, the Nova Seq 6000 generates 500 billion bases uh, per run, and that uh, makes it uh, the one of the cheapest way ways to uh, generate uh, sequencing uh, data just because this throughput is so so massive. Uh, <clears throat> still, especially for variant analysis, it's the most used platform today. But there are definitely there's definitely competition coming up both from the the long read side, but also from from other other technologies. But still, it's kind of the golden standard for for variant analysis. So uh, what kind of uh, sequencing data will you get from Illumina sequencing? Uh, typically you get, uh, well, reads of course, and these reads are relatively short, uh, meaning that they are in between 50 and maximum uh, 300 base per long. However, there is, there is um, something that is unique to Illumina sequencing, and that is that you can sequence paired ends. 
So that means that if you have a certain fragment, a certain DNA molecule, you can sequence it from both ends. And that is quite interesting because although your reads are short uh, and you are not sequencing this entire molecule, so as you can see over here, if these are the two reads, you're not sequencing this part, you do know that they come from the same molecule so that they should be at least from the same chromosome. And typically we also know that they are uh, at a certain, they should be at a certain distance from each other. You cannot know that in front exactly, but at least uh, typically you can know it's, for example, between 400 and 600 base pairs. And that's already quite a bit of information that you can use in your downstream analysis, for example, during the alignment. So if one of your reads ends up at a different chromosome that, and those reads were paired, you probably know that something is going on. So that you can use that information to increase your, to improve your uh, alignment. Um, <clears throat> so this is the kind of data you get, and how do you get uh, that uh, kind of kind of data? Uh, well, first it starts, of course, with extracting uh, DNA. Uh, we're not going to focus too much uh, on that, but once you have that DNA, that is typically if you did your, especially if you did your uh, extraction uh, well, then this DNA is still in relatively large molecules. And because we're using this paired and sequencing, we actually want to make those molecules a little bit uh, smaller. We do that by shearing. So by shearing, you make your, your you uh, cut up your DNA uh, randomly into smaller pieces. And then you do often uh, a size selection. So after shearing, you do a size selection and you only select uh, sizes, for example, between 400 and 600 base pairs. And that's important because then you know you, you know the expected distance between your forward and, and reverse read. After sharing and size selection, um, there is an adapter ligation. So these adapters, they are known um, oligos. Uh, we know uh, what they are. Um, and from these adapters, we can also add other oligos to it. For example, we can add a barcode, a barcode that is uh, for a specific for a sample, and we can add P5 and P7 sites, or actually we have to add P5 and P7 sites uh, for the uh, molecule, for the, the fragment to a new to the sequencing lane. So these are important for and leading to the sequencing lane. Well, the barcode, are important to identify which fragments came from which sample. So if you remember well, um, these uh, Illumina machines, they can have massive throughput, so they can really generate a lot of reads, but typically you do not want the same, uh, all of the reads coming from the same sample. So if you would have one Illumina run for a human genome, you probably cover it with like 10,000 times or so, or probably even more. So you usually you want to sequence multiple samples on a single run, and you do that with, with barcodes. So these barcodes, they are also uh, sequenced and associated with a fragment, and then you know exactly which read originated from which sample. Then there is a PCR step, uh, typically between 8 and 16 cycles. That's just to get enough uh, library in order to be able to actually do uh, the the sequencing to to load the the flow cell uh, properly, and after that uh, there is basically the process of sequencing. There is a link. Uh, this this uh, sequencing thing um, word uh, contains a link. If you click on it, you get a nice uh, YouTube movie uh, uh, showing you how the Illumina sequencing works we do not have time in this course to really go through that entire process but uh, you can have a look at it in your own time martin has a question yes please um, <clears throat> i recently got actually a library made and uh, the bioinvertition was asking for a pcr free library how mm -hmm. does this fit in here <laughs> uh well actually <laughs> it's basically without the pcr yeah, um, there, there, there. I think there are um, specific kits for that. Uh, typically, they require a lot, a uh, very high uh, input of DNA, uh, depending on your project that's possible or not. So you need really a lot of uh, DNA input to start with. Uh, so really micrograms of of DNA, and 
um, as far as I know, it is just a matter of, uh, let's say, the first three steps without the, the PCR. So then you make sure you have enough library after adding the barcode and B5, B7 sites, and then start the sequencing. I understand the advantage is that you uh, like you don't introduce any bias like mm -hmm. uh, from the PCR reactions. Indeed, indeed, and and mm -hmm. those biases they they do exist. Uh, for example, also um, you typically have uh, higher coverage uh, depending on your genome depending on the DC content of a specific uh, region. So that that also causes an unequal coverage over over your genome. That is partly caused by this this PCR step and PCR free libraries uh, run into that issue to a lesser extent. In addition, um, you also introduce, of course, uh, molecular duplicates, meaning that you find sequences origin originating from exactly the same fragment, and uh, those you typically want to remove. But there are ways to do that, and we'll discuss mm -hmm. that later on. In this so, I guess overall, my question is. Do you think it's necessary to have a, a better to have PCR free than regular? Because obviously regular is cheaper. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would say it, it is it is better. Uh, however, uh, it will definitely have an impact on your workflow. So it, it definitely means that you need very high quality DNA extraction and probably also the library preparation takes uh, a bit more more time and effort okay. and may, maybe also a bit more costly. Thanks. Uh, I think Giancarlo raises hand. Uh, yes, I just wanted to tell you, Martin, that we use that all the time in uh, genomic sequencing for human diagnostics, the PCR-free approach. So we routinely send our patients DNA for sequencing like this, and this simply because it gets better results in the end. But of course, it's, as Gert said, properly uh, a different workflow. Mm -hmm. Thanks. But it has its yeah. advantages in diagnostics for rare diseases, which we do. So we are really, really um, uh, dependent on a very high quality of output at the end. And that's why we use PCR-free Illumina sequencing. Cheers. Perfect. Thanks a lot. So, so I guess it all depends on whether, uh, what you can invest, for example. So I can imagine if you have like a, a project where you want to sequence 10,000 genomes, uh, you make different decisions than if you want to do uh, diagnostics, of course. Yes, we are very low throughput, actually, indeed. We don't have so many patients. That's, no, that's luckily. <laughs> Absolutely. We could, wouldn't be able to do too many. You know? um, perfect. Thanks, thanks for your addition, Giancarlo. Um, all right. So... Then I think it's important to talk about some definitions. So we now know how this library preparation works. Um, probably you have heard of it before, um, but it's important to uh, know what we are talking about. Uh, if we, for example, talk about fragments. So what we have is this molecule we generate during the library preparation, where we have the P5 and the P7 side. Um, we typically have a barcode in this molecule, so that helps us to uh, figure out which read came from which sample. Oops, look at that. We have the adapter, two adapters on both on both sides, and then we have the first read and second read and something in between. And what do we call those things? Well, typically, uh, if people talk about a fragment, um, that is the uh, let's say the unknown sequence and the known sequence, so the, the, the reads, including uh, the adapters, but without the barcode and the P5 and P7 side. So if you talk about fragment length, it can include, it typically includes the adapters. However, people call also fragment, uh, that's the, the only, the let's say the unknown DNA in between uh, the adapters, but that part is also referred to as insert side. An insert site, I think, is a little bit of a nicer name because it really depicts, okay, it is the stuff that is inserted between all uh, the known oligos in between the adapters, barcodes, and B5 and B7 sites. Then we also have something called inner distance, and the inner distance would be the distance between the three prime ends of the forward and reverse read. So that's actually the sequence, uh, the, the DNA you are not, of the fragment you are not sequencing. So that's basically the unknown part 
of dragon. Then some more definitions about sequencing in general. So what do we uh, consider as a library? A library are libraries are the uh, all the fragments together of one DNA sample or cDNA sample if you have been sequencing RNA that share a barcode. So that also means that if you have a single sample and uh, you generate two libraries out of those, those are two separate libraries. And typically you would also want to retain that information when you are doing variant analysis. Why that is, we will learn more about that later on. A sequence thing we're on would be a complete cycle of, of generating reads on a machine. Uh, I think that is uh, quite easy to uh, grasp uh, what it means. A flow cell would be the physical platform at which the sequencing takes place. So that's actually where the uh, fragments, the P5, P7 site, and new uh, to start uh, the sequencing. So a flow cell is used once in a sequencing. You know, so you load a flow cell on a, a sequencing machine. And then you have a lane, and that is a compartment within uh, a flow cell. So a flow cell can uh, contain multiple lanes. Some flow cells have only one lane, but for example, an S4 or an S2 flow cell contains two or four uh, lanes. And typically, uh, lanes are quite independent of each other, and whether a read comes from one lane or the other lane, that it can also be information you want. To, uh, to know, to retain when you're doing variant analysis. <clears throat> so how does a um, typical workflow look like? So what, uh, what you do in the lab is you create uh, independent libraries of, for example, uh, different samples, or usually it's one library per, per sample. Um, of course, you add the barcode uh, during uh, creation of the individual libraries. Once you have done that, you combine those uh, libraries together. Uh, so you pull them together in a single tube and you load those on uh, usually different uh, sequencing lanes. So after you do the sequencing, that results then uh, hopefully in, in pod Q files. What do they then look like? So Let's say, oops, you have lib1 over here, so library1 over here. Um, you have that identifier, uh, but which is generated by the demultiplexing software. An identifier, I think this is an identifier of the barcode, if I'm not mistaken, an identifier of the lane, and whether it's the forward or reverse read. And, oh, we only have uh, forward reads over here. So for, if we would only generate single entries over here for each lane, we would expect then uh, four FASTQ files. If we would have also reverse reads in there, we would expect eight uh, FASTQ files for each library one. And you have that for both lanes. So in this case, we have two files for each library and they are separated by lane. So, these machines, they uh, generate uh, signal intensities, and the signal intensities are converted by the, the base color and by the demultiplexing uh, into uh, individual FASTQ files. And these FASTQ files, of course, they contain uh, the sequencing reads. But in addition to the sequencing reads themselves, so this, these ADCT uh, um, uh, sequences, they also contain something that is called the base quality. The base quality tells you something about how sure the base color was that the base it is uh, presenting was actually that base. So if it says, okay, at this position, I have, an, I have an A, how sure was it that it was actually an A? And that is depicted in a FRED-based likelihood. And FRED-based likelihoods are always minus 10 times the log with base 10 of a certain probability. And in the case of base quality, this probability is that the, pro is the probability that the base was wrong. So let's say in a case where the base color was 1% sure that the base was wrong, or basically it 
was 99% sure that the base was correct, was called correct, then we have a base quality of 20. If it was 90% sure, it has a base quality of 10. If it was basically unsure, so probability, so 50-50, it could be wrong or right, uh, you get a base quality of three. So this thread-based likelihood is, is very, uh, it does a very good job in um, um, uh, specifying uh, differences at, at very low probabilities. So that's what you can also see over here. So um, you have uh, uh, over here the, the accuracy and, and the error as a function of the thread score. So the thread score of 10, uh, we are about at 0 0.1. But at very low pro probabilities, we can still find uh, differences in, in the thread score. Or as a question. Hi. Um, sorry, maybe I missed it. But so how does the, the machine know what the probability is of it being wrong? Yeah, so um, I will go into that a bit deeper in, in a few slides later. Uh, but basically, okay. to, to answer it, it quickly, because I understand that you have this question now, is um, when um, a base is incorporated during the sequencing, you get a certain light signal, and that has a certain color. And depending on how well the machine could pick up the color, so whether it was, let's say, red or green, um, it gives a, a probability. So if it's somewhere in between red or green, it has a very high probability that the base is wrong. If it was clearly red, for example, it has a very low probability that the base is wrong, so very high accuracy. But does that then mean that if there's like a snip, then it's anyway not so sure? Or? Uh, not really, because... Oh, because it's each find... individual read. It's yeah, each yeah, individual okay. read. In the... Yeah. So it's more like a light intensity thing? Yeah, okay. it's exactly that. Intensity and, yeah, so it's intensity and uh, um, what's the right word? So kind of uh, how how well uh, it depicts a certain color. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Giancarlo. Yes, Cora, just one thing. If you heard about that when, it's a snip, when it is a snip in case of Sanger sequencing, your uh, affirmation will be true because SNP double peaks in Sanger have a significantly lower thread score at that position. So if somebody has mentioned that to you, it's correct if he, the person was talking about Sanger sequencing. Fair, fair. Thanks. Yeah, great. Thanks for that, Giancarlo. Yes, I've, in uh, my previous work, I've been using Sanger sequencing in polyploids, and then it's even uh, uh, much more fun. Then, then we had after that we got next generation sequencing, which was really, really big improvement uh, in in uh, variance analysis in, in polyploids. So, to check with you, I have a question. Uh, let me change the screen sharing to Firefox. There we go. Uh, if you look. So uh, just to validate with you, because it's important, it's a very important concept in variant analysis. What does a high base quality mean? So if you, let's say, have a base quality of 30 or 40, what does that mean? OK. I don't see any additional answers, so I will stop. OK, well, great. Let's came across. I won't spend too much, uh, much more time on this anymore then. Awesome. All right, so indeed. So high base quality, so it means high thread score, means high accuracy, low error. Oh, good. So how is uh, how are these base qualities and sequences stored in a FASTQ file? Well, 
it's very likely you have been looking at the FOSQ file before. Uh, so many of the bioinformaticians uh, know this by heart probably. So a FOSQ file, uh, each record in the FOSQ file contains of uh, four lines. First line is the title of the sequence. So uh, basically that's the identifier of the sequence. And there's quite a bit to that identifier if we talk about Illumina uh, sequencing. There's actually information where that read uh, came from. I think I have an additional slide uh, that explains what is depicted in the FOSQ title. Then of course we have the nucleotide sequence. So that's a string of A, C's, uh, C's and G's. Then you have a third line, which is an optional description, um, is not used very frequently nowadays anymore. But it's, I think it's basically there for historical uh, reasons. Then the fourth line, and that's an interesting one, that contains actually the base quality. But this line has the same length uh, as the nucleotide sequence, and that is nice because then it's quite easy to uh, uh, refer um, to, to basically connect uh, the individual bases to a base quality. So these base qualities are, of course, not the numbers, so the actual integers, but they are characters that represent an integer. So uh, how that relates to each other, you can see over here, it's basically the order that uh, characters have in the ASCII uh, format. So for example, an exclamation mark means a base quality of zero and an I means a base quality of, of 41 and everything in between. So we have a, if we have a B over here, so the A over here has a base quality B, can anybody tell me what the base quality then should be? No one? Either the bio IO? I think 32. Uh, oh, so 33. 33. But, but, 33, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're right, yeah. indeed. So it's, it's relatively an easy way to, uh, to figure it out. However, of course, computers are way faster uh, to uh, make that translation compared to us because we have to look up, look it up in the table all the time, of course. But it's just a way of storing uh, base qualities in an efficient way. Another question for you? No, this one. So this might be a bit more interesting for the bioinformatician. So uh, there is this uh, program called uh, grep that you can use uh, to find strings in a file. So based on, for example, regular expression. So with uh, if you look at false A file, the false A file always starts with a greater than sign. So the title always starts with a greater than sign. And then with that, you can get, count the number of sequences in a false A file. So we have just learned that each title in a FOSQ file starts with an add sign. So uh, you probably have seen that. So each title starts with, with an add sign. So in principle, you could just find all the lines that start with an add sign and use grep with minus C, which counts the number of instances in order to count the number of records in a FOSQ file. However, this doesn't work. And why do you think that doesn't work? And if you don't know, just uh, give your best guess. Okay. 11 of you have answered. 12, even 13. Awesome. So close. So um, add is a special character in regular expression. That is not entirely the case as far as I am aware. So that's not correct. So most of you were right. The ads can also occur elsewhere in the FOSQ file in Leap. So if you go back to the slide, then we see that this add sign actually depicts the base quality of 31. So if you have the first base with a base quality of 31, you will have an add over here. And then also this line will be counted as a, as, as a record. 
So usually you overestimate the number of records if you use uh, grep with find and trying to find uh, lines that start with an add sign. So how so the way you can um, count the number of records in a pod queue file would be just by counting the number of lines and divided by four, because each record con consists of four lines. So um, what we then want to do when we have the pass queue file is, is perform the alignment margin as a question. Oh yes, just regarding the faster queue file, um, there is no way to find out the adapter sequences from this file, is it? Um, it depends. What what do you mean with finding out? Um, I understand one has to remove the adapter sequences. Mm -hmm. So you would do have to do an analysis. There is no like indication like one of the numbers given from the sequencing center what adapter was used. Well, uh, not not really. But there are many ways to find uh, adapter sequences. And um, so in the um, uh, introduction to NGS course, we go a bit deeper into that, but you will only get adapter sequences if the forward and reverse read completely overlap. Um, so in this case, uh, we have an unknown sequence in between. However, if your inter if your insert size is very short, shorter than the actual read length, so let's say we generate reads of 150 base pairs, but our insert size is only 100 base pairs. Then we're actually reading into the adapter, oh, yeah. and then you would expect adapter okay. sequence. Yeah. So that would also mean that we only expect adapter sequence if the forward and reverse read have um, the uh, basically also overlap in in sequence. Yeah. So, so you I can... think I think yeah. I got confused because uh, I read online. You know, sometimes people say you yeah, you need to remove adapters and trim them and others say oh you don't worry about them it's all automatically trimmed for you <laughs> <laughs> uh, i would say it's always a good idea to trim them uh, because they are they are sequences that do not occur in your reference genome and they can still interfere interfere with the mapping depending on the alignment software it uh, it can quite well ignore uh, adapter sequences uh, but but typically it's it's a good uh, good idea to to trim adapter sequences. And but I depending on, I understand sometimes software also requires adapter sequences to be fed in, you know, and then I don't have no idea. What can I yeah, <laughs> no, true. Yeah, then they have to be clear about that. Yeah, that's the thing with 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 academic software or software in general. If, uh, they have to document clearly what kind of input they require, of course. Okay. Cheers. Okay. So uh, if you talk about adapter sequence as well, it's not really a main focus of this course, so that's why I don't talk about it. It's always good uh, to, to remove them uh, if you expect them. Uh, so um, then um, with, um, uh, so we talked about the base quality, right? And we have a base quality because the, the base calling, they it can make uh, mistakes. Uh, the base color can make mistakes just because, um, well, Illumina sequencing isn't perfect. And that's important for variant analysis because, for example, what we see over here is, okay, this is pretty clearly we have a homozygous C, okay, pretty clearly we have a heterozygous T, but for example, over here, we see also a difference with the reference. We see an A over here, where well, the reference is C, but mostly it's, it's, it's reference. And we have to make a decision whether this over here, so where we have this A over here, is a variant, yes or no. And over here, if you just look at it, it's probably quite obvious, but it's not always that obvious, especially if you have, for example, lower coverage or more difficult uh, regions for the alignment. So then it's important to know whether this A, for example, has a high base quality or not, uh, because if, it's, if it has a high base quality, then it is unlikely that the uh, base color made a mistake. If it is a low base quality, it is quite likely that the base color made a mistake and this is an actual error. So these base qualities are important for, um, for variant analysis. Um, so why do those um, 
uh, lower base qualities occur and why is it uh, re especially relevant uh, for Illumina sequencing? Well, um, Illumina sequencing, as you have heard, is quite limited by, uh, by the read length. So at most for Illumina sequencing, you can generate reads of 300 base pairs. And if you have seen um, a FASTQ file of 300 base pairs uh, long, you probably also have seen that base quality quite quickly declines after 150 base pairs. So even, so the three, the three prime ends of the retard have usually have way lower base qualities compared to the beginning, so the five prime. And that's also the reason why Illumina sequencing is, is limited in terms of, of read length. So why is that? Well, that's because, um, at the process of sequencing, there's a step, uh, called a uh, bridge. Uh, amplification. And during this bridge amplification step, what happens is that you have a single fragment that is annealing to the sequencing lane. And um, that single fragment is amplified at the same spot or at a very in close proximity uh, to the original fragment uh, on the sequencing lane. So that it's also some kind of a PCR uh, step. And that is required because this uh, base incorporation uh, during the sequencing requires multiple molecules. So if you have, if you would have only a single fragment over there and you, there will be a base incorporation, that signal strength is just not uh, strong enough to be able to pick it up at all. So what is done, you have this bridge application. So you have many uh, fragments over there in the same spot, and then a base gets incorporated at the same time amplifying the signal because it occurs in so many molecules at the same uh, time and then the signal can be picked up. However, this base incorporation is uh, not flawless. So uh, mistakes are made over there. So that means that, for example, if, if a mistake is made, maybe there is uh, one uh, base uh, skipped um, in the process of the base incorporation. And then instead of a C is incorporated, a C is incorporated, just because um, uh, at the previous step, uh, the base incorporation was skipped. So these errors, they always occur and they build up towards the end of the read, of course. So the further you go into sequencing by synthesis, the more errors build up. And then you can imagine this uh, signal intensity gets blurred because you just get more different bases incorporated, so more different colors, uh, emitted and therefore at some point the base quality becomes lower and lower because the if let's say if a C is incorporated uh, which where, where you would expect a red signal you have a lot of, of blurred colors uh, in there and therefore the base color um, is less sure that the cold base is actually that base and therefore you get lower base qualities towards the three prime end of the read until a certain point where just the base quality isn't high enough to uh, be sure that the, the base that is um, specified is, uh, can actually be used for analysis. So we have some limitation uh, in Illumina and that is caused by this requirement for bridge amplification. So probably, or many of you probably have used POSQC um, before, where you can see if you have, for example, a 300 base pair long read of Illumina, it truly declines, base quality truly declines towards the end of the read. And therefore the sequencing, um, the, the read sequencing, uh, the read length is, uh, is limited by this out of phase uh, signal. So the long read sequencing uh, methods, they do not have that issue because what they do is they can maximize the signal from a single molecule based readout. It means that it uh, only sequences a single molecule. So not multiple molecules in this, in this, in this spot where you have bridge amplification at the same time, but we can get a signal out of a out of only one molecule. And therefore, uh, it is pretty much unlimited uh, of how long your reads are. Uh, Michael has, has a question. Yes, I have one question, maybe probably linked to this bridge application step at Illumina. Uh, we once discussed with my colleagues vaguely problem of so-called so, so -called, uh, uh, optical uh, 
how is it called when you basically optical what happens duplicate. is that optical duplicates yes so it's like so because you can have duplicate reads maybe from pcr but also it's called optical duplicates which means that you by chance create two duplicate islands uh, for this uh, bridge amplification is mm -hmm. but i've never specifically searched for it or corrected for that is it something and i know that there are different uh, Types of sequences uh, are affected probably based on what the flows, what the, what, what the flow cell really looks. Um, can you comment a little bit on that if it's still an issue or it's not really yeah. something that nowadays people would No, look into? it's uh, it is still an issue, definitely. Um, and it's actually optical duplicates are quite easy to detect um, mm -hmm. because we have this information in the FOSQ file where the read actually came from. Um, so uh, I will go into that later on. Uh, I think three or four slides from here. Uh, so, so more about that later on. But it's uh, also with uh, with newer flow styles, it is definitely still an issue. It still occurs, but it's I wouldn't say it's a big issue actually. Uh, but, but more about more about that later. Okay, thank you. Um, so, because you um, read from a single molecule, you do not have this out of phase signal. Uh, so in principle, in theory, you have an unlimited read length. Uh, so your read length is not limited anymore by out of phase, but basically by the length of the molecule you are sequencing. Um, or by uh, the uh, um, how long your sequencing uh, can actually run. That's, of course, also an important limitation. So uh, in order to do that, uh, there are two frequently used platforms. Uh, probably you've heard of them before, actually we've talked about them before, as that is BACBIO single molecule. It's, it's already in the name, real-time sequencing and Oxford nanopore technology. Um, in the introduction to NGS course, we will go into that a little bit more deeper. Uh, in this course, not really. Um, it used to be uh, for for both methods uh, that uh, accuracy was really an issue, especially if you want to apply it to variant analysis. We already kind of saw that for variant analysis, this base quality is is important. So uh, they used to have very low base qualities or relatively low base qualities, and that means that you have a lot of mistakes. So this is a relatively old run of Oxford nanopore technology sequencing. What you see over here is that there are most likely also mistakes of, of just skip, um, skip sequences. So we have a lot of insertions and deletions in there, which seems to be a mistake. But also uh, over here, there are probably uh, single nucleotide um, uh, errors in there. So for variant analysis, it used to be really a challenge. Uh, I would say still for Oxford nanopore, Oxford nanopore technology, it still kind of can be a challenge, but both the sequencing and the software has very much improved in the last few years. Uh, for back bio sequencing, that's not really an issue anymore because it actually creates higher accuracy reads compared to Illumina sequencing. So very few mistakes in there. So, um, well, it used to be that long reads uh, generated more errors, still kind of the case for Oxford nanopore uh, technologies, uh, technology, and that, that causes difficulties for variant analysis. However, with BACBIO circular consensus sequences, or nowadays they're called hi-fi reads, you actually get a very high base quality and also uh, no bias in, in where you will find the errors. Well, for Oxford nanopore technology, you still find a bit of bias on where to find the errors. Um, <clears throat> in addition, long reads can have much higher mapping qualities, which means that the alignment uh, is usually much, much better because uh, of longer reads, it's um, easier to find the most probable location in the reference uh, genome. You just have high, bigger puzzle pieces, basically. And in addition, what you can, of course, do with, with long reads, and that counts both for PacBio and for nanopore technology, is that haplotyping is very, very much improved because you just have longer stretches uh, originating uh, from the same chromosome. So if, especially if you're interested in haplotyping, then uh, long reads can really, really very much improve your analysis. So now we have discussed the sequencing uh, technologies. 
So we focused on the Lumina sequencing and we also have heard a bit about uh, long read sequencing. So what can you sequence? Um, well, usually you think about whole genome sequencing or whole metagenome sequencing. Uh, however, um, that can be uh, relatively expensive and also it will just generate a lot of data and therefore also the analysis usually takes way longer if you do whole genome sequencing compared to a reduced representation of your genome. So you can reduce the representation of the genome by, for example, whole exome uh, sequencing. That means that you use uh, bait to capture uh, all of the exomes out of your genome, because typically we are interested in uh, genic regions and not so much in, in intronic or intergenic uh, regions. So then uh, you have a much reduced representation of your reference genome. It's usually cheaper for sequencing and also reduces the amount of data a lot, which also reduces the computational uh, requirement a lot. Um, other than that, you can have restriction enzyme-based uh, reduced representation where you basically randomly cut your genome uh, with a frequent and, and rare uh, cutter and then um, actually sequence that. Uh, used to be very popular in ecology or maybe still is and also in agriculture. Uh, you can also think of amplicon sequencing if you're only interested in a, in a part, a small part of the of the genome. Um, what you can also do is is multiplexing uh, a PCR where you, for for example, focus on a hundred uh, small, uh, relatively small regions. Or um, what people also nowadays do quite quite a lot is, for example, if you if you're interested in a single gene, you just uh, create maybe ten or twenty amplicons of that gene and then sequence. Uh, only those 10 or 20 amplicons, for example, with Sanger sequencing or even better with Oxford nanopore technology. You can also do variance analysis in rna data. data. Uh, can be quite challenging uh, because, uh, first of all, uh, you have a difference in coverage, of course, because one gene is higher expressed than, than the other gene. Uh, but other than that, you can also have allele-specific expression. So that means that one allele is more expressed than the other, other allele. So you have an unbalanced division uh, between your, your two alleles. So once you have your FASQ file, uh, you do uh, a read alignment typically. So what you need for that is your FASQ file, obviously, and a reference uh, genome. So typically you want to align to a reference genome. Ideally, that consists of, of uh, uh, pseudo molecules, so whole chromosomes, like, for example, the human reference genome. And then what an aligner does, it tries to find the most likely position uh, a read uh, originated from, uh, from the reference uh, genome. And that information is then stored in a uh, SOM file. And I think I will stop here for a bit because I've been already been talking for an hour. Martin has questions. Yes, regarding sequencing technologies and fast Q files, I was just wondering. Can you actually um, mix different technologies? Like, I guess you can just take all kinds of fast Q files from PacBio and from Illumina and do your analysis with them. Is mm -hmm. this something people consider or is this bad practice? Or, you know? uh, no, it's not, nec not necessarily bad practice. Um, so typically, I guess what you would do there is you do the variant analysis on the two um, on the two methods separately. Then you have two two VCFs, so two lists of variants basically, and you try to combine and or compare those. It's quite difficult to do a, a variant calling on a uh, an alignment cell that both contains for let's say pack reads and and preliminary. Okay, so there's some difficulties, I guess. Yeah. And then another yeah. question, yeah. Another question yeah, is, is, is uh, obviously, <clears throat> if you align to your reference, um, you know, um, I guess the reference could also have some errors. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you could have like 
several different isolates, you know, and um, maybe from some of them you have a reference. Yeah, that's true. Um, so that's really, um, uh, that's also a big topic in, in, in eukaryotes uh, in general. Um, so uh, what we know now is that you have, you can have pretty big variation. So really actually massive uh, differences of uh, kilobase and kilobase or even megabase between individuals. So we were talking about the structure of variation and the structure of variation even with, within the human population can be very big. So that means that if you have a single reference genome and you are sequencing an individual with an insertion compared to the, to the, the reference genome, you will never align those reads of that insertion to the reference mm. genome. Yeah. And that can be considered a bit of a of a challenge, and that's where all these pan genome initiatives uh, are focusing on. So I guess uh, what what we would be doing is uh, to 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 always sequence also the reference strain again. Is this something other people do? <laughs> you know, like as a control. Uh, yeah, well, bas bas yeah. Uh, basically, what you do is um, uh, well, what of course happens is that uh, reference. Uh, genomes they improve through time so nowadays we have the for human uh, we have the telomere to telomere sequence for example um, and that occurs in many different organisms so reference genomes they they do improve and they tend to become also combinations of multiple reference genomes so to, that you have a an as complete as possible representation um, of of your species uh, but that is more and more extended to more uh, graph-based representations of reference you know where you uh, basically represent the entire pan genome of a species in a single reference genome, but it's not that is not very common yet to to use those uh, references. But okay, it will, so I think, it will be more and more common in the future, especially for human genetics. So, just to recap, so um, we have a fast QFL course with the, the actual sequencing reads and their base qualities. And with an aligner, what you do is try to find the most probably probable position of your reads uh, on a reference genome. And usually only one position is recorded, but you can also uh, choose to have multiple positions, for example. Um, but, but typically for variant analysis, you want the most probable position. And of course, what the aligner also does is um, define a probability uh, on how sure it was that the read actually aligned to that specific place. So this is what read alignment uh, can look like. This is a visualization in ITV. Uh, you, maybe you have heard of ITV before, but did you also use it uh, during this, uh, this course to visualize some, some, some alignment? So what you see over here is the paired and alignment with the forward and at reverse read. And um, everything that is gray has exactly the same sequence as the reference genome. Everything that not as a different uh, as a as a as a difference between the read and and the reference genome. That's what you want to end up with. So <clears throat> there is a lot of software available uh, to do uh, read alignment. Uh, very frequent, uh, frequently used ones are um, Bowtie 2 and BWA uh, for variant uh, analysis. Um, and nowadays there is also um, uh, Dragon uh, available uh, for, for Illumina reads also developed by Illumina. And that um, is uh, performing uh, even uh, uh, quite a bit better than BWA and Bowtie 2 and can also be used uh, for, for free. So if you're interested in that, uh, let me know, then I can give you the link where to find it and how to use it. For long reads, people usually use Minimap2. Um, that is uh, developed by the developer of, if I'm not mistaken, I have to say it right, BWA, uh, Hang Lee, or is it Bowtie? No, the Bowtie is Ben Langmeet, I think. So I think it's BWA. Minimap2 um, has some different assumptions compared to the short read uh, aligners and, and, is, and is also very fast in aligning these, these long reads because you can imagine that it uh, has some penalty on how 
quickly you can uh, align uh, reads. And also with Minimap, we can also align short reads, by the way, and it performs also quite well. Um, so then a few words about mapping quality. So we have been talking about uh, base quality before, and we also have mapping quality. So what you can have, for example, is on your reference genome, you can have two locations on your reference genome that are relatively similar, that have very similar sequence. So the, the for example, caused by recent gene duplication. So these are the blue parts. If you are generating sequencing, relatively short sequencing reads out of those uh, locations, what you can have is, for example, reads that completely are within the, the blue region. And then, of course, for the aligner, it becomes very difficult to decide whether this blue read over here actually comes from this position in the genome, so on the left side, or the duplication on, on the right side. Actually, depending on how similar those two regions are, the aligner might just have no clue where it came from because you have pretty much exactly the same uh, sequences over there. And how sure the aligner was where a read belongs in a reference genome is depicted by the mapping quality. So again, it's spread-based, like the base qualities, but uh, the only difference is uh, the probability, the type of probability we have. So in this case, for mapping quality, is the probability that the mapping position is wrong. So not the call base, but the mapping position. So you can imagine that these reads that are completely blue have a very, very high probability that the mapping position is wrong. So therefore, a very low mapping quality. Um, uh, and for example, reads uh, that uh, are partly in the green region or entirely in the green region that is pretty much unique in the reference genome have a very low probability that the mapping position is wrong and therefore a very high mapping quality. So you can imagine that this mapping quality is, of course, very important for, for variance analysis, because if you do not know where a read actually belongs on a reference genome, it's also virtually impossible or very difficult uh, to uh, call variance. And these mapping qualities, they're all taken, like the base quality, taken into account with downstream analysis software. So for example, DATK uh, takes both mapping quality and base quality and many other things, but uh, these two also into account when it calls the, the variance. I have a question for you. So <clears throat> if you have learned what indels are this morning, um, and um, you've also seen some of them in, in these uh, visualizations of the alignment during the, the presentation. So the question is, why do you think uh, are indels more difficult to detect from alignments compared to these SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms? Okay, if you must have answered. All of you have answered. Great. And I would indeed agree with, with most of you. Um, I would agree to say it's all of the above. So um, because there is no base quality, it depends whether you're looking at a deletion compared to the reference or an insertion. If it's a deletion compared to the reference, they, you do not have a base quality of the deletion itself. So it's very difficult to estimate whether that deletion was because of sequencing error uh, or just because it's really an, a real deletion in, in the read. Um, Martin has a question. Yes, please. <clears throat> Regarding the uh, last slide you were showing, the mapping quality score, map Q, that mm -hmm. is per, per, per base or is this per sequence? Per read, per, per oh. alignment, actually. Per, per, per alignment, per read. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, so uh, the second issue was because it is difficult to know the correct alignment, and you will learn more about that in the tomorrow. But you can imagine, especially if your uh, insertion deletion is in a repeat or a homopolymer, it's very difficult to know what is actually a deletion and what's an insertion. So what is uh, the most probable um, um, confirmation 
uh, what uh, that or the most probable mutation actually I should say that the most probable mutation that has caused uh, this insertion or or deletion, and depending on where the read aligns, uh, typically aligners make different decisions, and therefore uh, the alignments uh, around insertion deletions are usually very very messy. And third, uh, because they are often present in repeats and homopolymers, so you also have a typically low mapping qualities or difficulties with mapping quality in these in these regions. So indeed, uh, all of the above. So these alignments they are stored in a sample uh, stands for sequence alignment uh, format. And you probably also have heard of a BOM file. The BOM file is nothing more than just a compressed a binary BOM format. So as you have seen, so it will be the uh, information uh, for which read aligns where in the genome and that's uh, produced by the, by the aligner. So what does a SOM file look like? Um, a SOM file, like many files in bioinformatics, starts with a header. And header uh, contains metadata about uh, the file, uh, in this case, uh, the sum file. So uh, it starts, uh, the header always starts with an add sign. So each line in the header starts with an add sign. Um, it can, it contains, for example, information about the version of the sum file. As far as I know, there's only, only one version. So typically it's uh, 1.0. And also about how the sum file is, is sorted, for example, whether it is sorted based on the order of the reads in the class 2 file, or whether it is, for example, sorted based on position in the genome. So already from the sum header, you can see where, how it has been sorted. There's always information about the reference. So the chromosomes, in this case, this is an E. coli chromosome, so it has a bit, bit of a weird chromosome name, and it only has one chromosome, but of course, if you would aligned, for example, to the human chromosome, then you will find chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three, and so on, and their length. That is always required in some cell. A third, uh, uh, pretty much required uh, header line uh, would be the PG um, uh, tag, and this PG tag tells you which programs have been used to uh, create uh, the bomb file. So every time a program does a calculation on the bomb file or changes the bomb file, um, it will add a line with add PG and tell you which program has been used. So you, uh, each, each sum file contains basically its own history in the header. And that is quite powerful because, for example, if you receive a bomb file from a colleague, then you can just check out the header and see what kind of programs have been used and what kind of program calls have been used to create this bomb file. So after the header, there's the actual uh, sum format, it is uh, just a tab delimited cell. It's basically, you can also you can also just load an Excel basically um, with a whole bunch of columns. Um, I will just go shortly, quickly through them. So the first column is the, is the read name. Um, so uh, if you, this is an example of an, a sequence from SRA, uh, but of course, if you would be, if it would be uh, raw Illumina reads, then you have this specific Illumina header with all the information where the reads actually came from. Then the second column is, is a thumb flag and that contains all kinds of characteristics about the alignment. For example, whether uh, it is marked as a duplicate or um, <clears throat> whether um, it's made this map or whether the read is actually mapped at all and so on. And those characteristics are all stored as a single integer and that's quite a um, smart way how to do it because you only have to store a single integer, but contains really a lot of information about what the kind of features the alignment has. If you want to know more about that, just Google uh, some flag and you'll get more and more information about what kind of information can be stored in there. Then uh, the reference chromosome where the read aligns to. So in this case, this read aligns to chromosome 20, the start position, so it aligns really at the beginning of chromosome 20. Then we have the mapping quality. So uh, Martin, as you can see, uh, each read or each alignment in this case has a certain mapping quality. In this case, 42, so very high, so very low probability that this uh, read could align somewhere else in the reference genome. 
Then there's a sticker string which tells you um, um, how the alignment is, whether you have, uh, for example, insertions or deletions in there, um, whether the mate is mapped to the same reference. So you get an equal sign um, if it is equal to the, the other, uh, so the, 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 the read we're actually focusing on. If it's a different chromosome, you get a different chromosome there. Get information about the start and end position of the mate. Then we get information about the fragment length because we do an alignment. Uh, we know uh, we can estimate the, the fragment length, which can be uh, relevant information. Um, there was a question by Ayo. Uh, yeah, um, so the question is about the SIGA string. Um, I'm just wondering how it tells you um, how the um... An alignment was. I'm not sure how this 150M yeah. give that information. Yeah. yeah, no, I see. So we we do not have a lot of time during this course to really focus on that. We uh, focused on it in the introduction to NGS course. But basically, um, in short, what it does, it um, gives you a string of first an integer, then a letter, and then and then it can be an integer and then a letter again. And, and, and many uh, repetitions of that. In this case, it tells us 150 M and 150 M tells you 150 matches. So apparently this, this read is 150 base pairs long and all of those 150 base pairs match to the reference uh, genome. So if there is a, an insertion in there, then let's say you get 30 M, so the first read uh, matches with, with 30 reads. Then let's say if the insertion is five pair, base pairs long, we say five I, and then uh, 60 M again. So that's how these figure strings uh, work. But as I said, we cannot spend too much time on it. There are really a lot of, there are really a lot of resources on the internet to, to, to check it out. And you also- So that would, uh, just, so that would just mean that, sorry about that, uh, that you would have, mm -hmm. you would see other, uh, uh, let's like M or I indicating whether it's matches or, or insertions. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, yeah, okay. And uh, it can be relevant to realize that if you have a single base pair difference between the read and the reference, that is not stored in a sticker string because we already stored a sequence in the sound file and we do not want to store similar information twice. It's a bit of a, a theoretical um, uh, issue but I think it's, um, if we talk about sticker strings, it's relevant to know that, so basically SNPs, so single base differences between the reference and, and the reads are not stored in the sticker string, but they are stored in, in the sequence. I think, oh, I lost me, go back, sorry. Accidentally, back the button. So there is a question of Martin. Yes, sorry, maybe I didn't understand correctly. <clears throat> the SAM file, can it contain multiple alignments of the same read? Yeah. Okay, thanks. So each line in the software is an alignment, and that means that um, you can have uh, multiple alignments per read. So technically it's possible. Um, or uh, in default settings for both both I2 and BWA, as far as I know, it will only produce a single alignment per read. But yes. what you can, for example, also have is um, an alignment, I think it's called a chimeric alignment, where only part of the read aligns somewhere and the other part of the read aligns on another chromosome. Then it can say, okay, I also have two alignments for the same read, but then it's two parts aligned somewhere else. Uh, Lorena has a question. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so I want to know, let's say if I, I'm not sure uh, between two reference, you know, which one to use, then mm -hmm. if I get it kind of result, should I focus more on the mapping quality and to choose which one to select, let's say? Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, choosing, choosing the reference uh, genome uh, mm -hmm. for your analysis, it is actually very important. That's a very important step in your 
your analysis and you should make that decision as, as early as possible. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is that um, it can be very cumbersome or sometimes even impossible to change your reference, you know, while you are doing your variant analysis. So let's say if you have your PCF uh, from, um, uh, let's say, reference genome you know, from 2010, and they want to actually um, change the coordinates in that PCF to a reference genome you know, from 2020, that is actually uh, can be a very challenging task uh, to do. There are ways to do it called, called doing a lift over, but it's not, not a very easy task. So choosing references is, is very important. Um, so, and, and of course you can have different reasons for choosing uh, one reference or, or the other. Maybe you want to compare it to older projects, maybe then you take an older reference or you want to take the newest. So of course taking a newest, newer reference, reference or reference that uh, is more similar to the organism you are uh, interested in, um, of course gives a better representation of the truth. So that does mean that you might get um, uh, so typical, so let's say maybe a newer reference actually is able to uh, create uh, a good reference of a recent gene duplication while a previous reference actually merged those together. So yeah. basically if with the older reference you might have gotten high, map high mapping qualities but that probably meant that you were aligning reads from those two duplicated genes to a a uh, piece of, of sequence that was actually are, was supposed to be two, dif uh, two different uh, positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Does that answer your question? Because, uh, <laughs> yeah, because this, for example, is from a soil sample. So it will be isolated from my microbial, some bacteria. And then, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I can, I can use the reference genome from the genius, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. And that would be enough, maybe. Right. Can you can you repeat your last sentence? Uh, yeah. It, maybe if the bacteria is not 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 known, so it's not. Uh, yeah, not so exactly. Uh, so like a a little bit like the novel genome assembly. So that's that's mm -hmm. that's why I would like to maybe to try different. Uh, uh, alignments uh, and to check the values which one is best to use. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, so basically, ideally, just for the sake of, um, you know, uh, uh, true positive variant uh, or false negative variant and so on, you want to have a reference that is most similar to the individual you are uh, yes. researching. Mm -hmm. However, you know, maybe in the NOVA assembly, you do not have a good annotation. And then if you are interested in mainly variants that have an effect on, on, for example, the protein sequence, then you might, again, go to an older or a different reference genome you know, because you're mostly interested in that. So it's always a bit of a of balance. Okay. Thanks. No worries. Okay, so then we have secret string, uh, information about the reference and the fragment length. So that's part of the information you have in the sample. What's also stored in the sound file is the actual sequence of the read and the base qualities. And then there are some optional tags, for example, information about the alignment score, and that tells you how, how good uh, the alignment was. So that's what all aligners do. They calculate some kind of alignment score, and based on the alignment score, they decide, okay, this is a significant alignment and this is not, for example. Um, another tag that can be used is, for example, information about the read group and more more about that later on. So, question review. Okay, the question is, can you technically regenerate the fast Q file out of the SOM file? So, let's say you only have the SOM file and you want to regenerate the plus Q file. The question is, can you do that? And uh, another question is, can you regenerate the reference sequence to which you have a line from the thumb file? So that's basically, you have to use the information you just learned about the thumb file format. And the question is whether you can regenerate the plus Q file and whether you can regenerate the reference sequence.
Okay. Thank most of you have answered. So I'll stop. There we go. Ooh. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So uh, I guess that this is a this is a relevant point uh, because the sample is is relevant, of course, for for variance analysis. So um, let's start with the first one. So only the fast Q fell. So let's go back to the presentation. So if you think what is stored in a fast Q file. So the fast Q file basically contains the read name. So the read name over here, we have that one. Uh, for a raw liminal read, it looks a bit different, but anyway, we have we have the read name. So the only thing would we would need to do is just paste an add before that, but that should be uh, quite uh, quite doable. So what else is in the fast Q file? The, that's the, the sequence uh, read, so the actual sequence. Uh, we do have that also in the sample. And also what is stored there, so in the third line, that's usually empty. In the fourth line, we have the base qualities. And the base qualities are also in there. So in principle, uh, we can reproduce the FASTQ file from uh, the sample. So that's one. So then the question, can we regenerate the reference genome from the sample? Well, we do have some information about the reference genome, and that information is in the header. So in the header, we have information about the reference genome, uh, which is the chromosome name and their length. However, the reference genome itself, of course, contains the actual sequences of the chromosomes. That is not stored in, in a sample. So it's only the, um, so the chromosome names and, and their length, and not the original sequence of the reference genome. So the answer is, let's go back again to the VVOX question. Uh, only the FASTQ file. So you can regenerate only the FASTQ file because we have the FASTQ header, we have the sequence and we have the base qualities, but we do not have information about the reference genome. Is that a bit clear? Okay, good. So again, if you have any questions, doubts, if I go too fast, if I go too slow even, just uh, let me know. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the song format. Um, there is really a lot more to say about song format, but simply because we do not have uh, a lot of time during this course, we cannot read everything. Another important concept that relates to some files or alignment files is the concept of read groups. Uh, in principle, it's a relatively simple concept. What you sometimes want is to have multiple groups of reads in a bound file. For example, if you have two libraries of one sample and you want to, to, to keep track of which, which read came from which library, but you want to have them in the same some file. You can do that with, with read groups. So what you do is you add uh, um, uh, a header line that gives uh, that specifies the read group and gives metadata and gives, gives an identifier. And for each read, you add a tag uh, with that identifier, where right? it comes from one uh, library or from the other. It's not only uh, libraries uh, you can specify there. It can be anything, typically. Um, it is used to uh, add metadata uh, of alignments. For example, the sample identifier, um, well, the library identifier, lane identifier, uh, and so on. Which platform was used? For example, Illumina or PacBio. So you can have with read groups both PacBio and Illumina sequences in the same bomb file, but then the uh, analysis might be a bit challenging, and so on. We will use those, of course, so that's why I'm mentioning it. So this is how it looks, what it looks like. Um, this is a very uh, simplified uh, example of a sum file. So we have um, two header lines added there, and those header lines start with at rt. And these, sorry, they, these have an identifier. So we have an identifier called rg1, and we have an identifier rg2. So read group one, read group two. And over here in this example, they both come from the same sample, but different library. 
And if we have those reads in, or these alignments in uh, the sum file, we add at the very last column, a tag starting in RG, then a Z specifying what kind of information we can expect, whether it's a string or a number, the Z stands for string, and then the identifier of the read group. So this alignment came from library one, this alignment from library two. So that's how these read groups uh, actually work. And you will do some exercise with that later on this afternoon. Then duplicates. Um, so uh, as you have learned, there's PCR step uh, in the during the library preparation, and that can actually um, uh, that will result in a fragment in your library that are not coming from an individual fragment, but actually come from the same fragment. And usually you want to get rid of those, and you want to find them, of course. So um, how it works, usually if you do not have any UMIs, more about UMIs later, is that you just try to find alignment that align in exactly uh, the same uh, position. And then you say, okay, if they align exactly in the same position, it probably cannot happen by chance, depending a little bit on your coverage, of course, but let's say we assume that this cannot be happened by chance. So we're going to assume that these are actually duplicate, either from PCR or an optical duplicate. Cora has a question. Hi, sorry, yes. So this is because you're assuming that the DNA sharing at the very, very start is like always going to produce like completely different, that, that's where it comes from originally. Yeah, that the position of the sharing is, is random, indeed. Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, and that's indeed a bit of an issue because if you do antimatic sharing, um, that is as random as possible, but not completely random. So you might uh, misidentify duplicates even even because of because of that. So there are some there are some issues there, and and, and indeed this this non um, non random sharing is is one is one issue. Um, so there are two, and more about it later. So there there are two uh, different duplicates uh, in general. So we speak about two different types of duplicates. So that's where we are We are discussing these optical duplicates. So let, basically, regular duplicates can occur anywhere on the flow cell. So you can, it can uh, originate from the uh, same original fragment, but can occur anywhere on, on the flow cell. An optical duplicate is actually easier to detect. And it's usually also and whether something is an op optical duplicate or not, it's usually that information can be stored also in the in the sum file. And usually, if a duplicate is specified as an optical duplicate, you are more sure that it's a real duplicate, other than that it's uh, occurring, for example, non-random sharing or just has occurred by chance. So, an optical duplicate uh, actually occurs if you have two spots that are uh, in very near proximity from each other and have exactly the same sequence or at least the same uh, alignment. Uh, this can happen if one molecule ends up it, uh, in, a, in just a different position of, of the spot and also it's bridge amplified over there. Sometimes just some fragments, they kind of end up somewhere in, 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 a, in a neighboring spot and then you'll get bridge, bridge amplification and then um, um, so then exactly the same original fragment gets bridge amplified in two different neighboring spot, spots, and then it becomes an optical duplicate. Um, there are two different ways of, um, two, two different kinds of flow cells. Um, I must admit, I kind of forgot the name, but uh, you have one flow cell that is that is in a grid, which, is, which are the more modern flow cells, and one flow cell that is more positioned randomly. In these randomly positioned, uh, flow cells, I think optical duplicates used to occur a little bit more frequent, but even in this grid-based flow cells, it still occurs quite frequently that one uh, fragment ends up in a different spot and then gets bridge amplified, causing these optical duplicates. So for the person, I, forgot, I think it was Michael that asked that question about optical duplicates. Does this answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's aligned with what I discussed before. Okay. Thanks for the explanation. All right. 
Um, so about marking duplicates, it's important, especially for variant calling, uh, for example, for, uh, let's say for rna for example, if you have a, a nice complex library, then for rna it's not uh, essential that you do, but for variant calling, it's rather important because what you assume when you call var variant is that each read is an independent observation of the genome. And if it's a duplicate, then that isn't, isn't an independent observation because duplicates are dependent of each other. They come from the same original fragment. So um, if you are using uh, duplicates in your variant analysis, you're actually violating uh, this, uh, this assumption and therefore you typically want to remove those, those duplicates. Um, <clears throat> however, uh, what can happen is that they uh, you mark things as duplicate, but they still have a different molecular origin. So then you are actually removing information, which is a pity. Typically in a high quality library, however, uh, removing duplicates doesn't have a big effect on variant analysis. It's mainly in libraries that are lower quality, for example, where you had lower input DNA, where you have then a lot of duplicates, where it actually is becoming more and more important to, to mark those, those duplicates. Um, what really helps in marking duplicates um, are unique molecular identifiers or UMIs. So what are those UMIs? UMIs are random sequences that are added to the fragment before you do the PCR reaction in the library preparation. And um, this is a random sequence, uh, meaning that you can have uh, the same UMI occurring multiple times in the same library, but it becomes uh, a very small chance that you have a read with the same UMI that also aligns exactly at the same position in the reference genome. So with this UMI, what you can do is actually um, find false positive uh, duplicates. So here we have the same image as we had before, but then we have UMI information attached to it. So we have this this blue tag and the, the green, blue, purple, uh, yellow, and orange, all depicting different UMIs. And uh, in this case, what we see is that we have um, exactly the same alignment so with the green tag compared to the blue one, but because it has a different UMI, we do not specify it as a duplicate of the blue uh, alignment. So then we can actually better uh, find uh, false positives maybe just they can occur just by chance and then only remove the real duplicates. So um, your accuracy of duplicate marking very much increases when you use these mo uh, unique molecular identifiers or UMIs. 